Someone who felt stuck or trapped like I was, living a miserable life, thinking that when they make X amount of money, when they get to a certain level in their career, that they're going to be happy. They keep <coughs> getting quite emotional about this, but they keep putting it off and putting it off, thinking that later is the time to do it, when later may never come. All right, folks, let's hit pause right here for a moment because I have a burning question for you. Are you really living your life or are you just surviving on the hamster wheel, telling yourself you'll be happy someday? Trust me, someday is the slipperiest slope there is. It's always out of reach, always dangling just a little further ahead. So before you dive into this story of restless minds and daring escapes, ask yourself this question. What's stopping you from jumping off that wheel right now? Because later might never come. I've been having a lot of thoughts recently about where I'm currently at, the direction I'm going in, and I'm really grateful for what I'm doing at the moment. I want to make this video for someone who perhaps was like how I was in my previous life. Someone who is looking for a bit more meaning, a little bit more fulfillment. And this video is to help me get a bit of clarity on my own thoughts and also to help someone who may be in, this, in a similar situation that I was a few years ago. Like it says in the tin, I'm currently on a mountain in Colombia, near a small town called Minca. Okay, stop right there. A mountain in Colombia, searching for meaning. This is giving me strong eat, pray, love vibes, but with a side of existential dread. Let me ask you, do we need to scale a mountain to find ourselves? Or are we just running away from what scares us at sea level? Deep stuff, I know. Let's continue. Staying in a hut, and it's lovely but my mind is restless and I want to talk about some things that I've been thinking about for a little while now. So out of all the things in my life, I think my job has brought me the most misery and the most suffering. Being a doctor is one of those jobs which sounds really cool and awesome, but I think the reality of it is very different to what people assume. So I studied in the UK, I worked for a couple of years in the NHS, and for those two to three years that I was working in the NHS, I'd say I was probably at my peak of my misery. Now it's been a while since I worked there, so I'm trying to remember why I was so miserable. And I think there were a few reasons. Firstly, the NHS is it's a wonderful thing, providing free healthcare to everyone who lives in the UK. But unfortunately, it's so under-resourced, it's so understaffed. It's a beautiful place, but it's a miserable place to work in. Can we just take a moment right now to appreciate this beautiful irony? The NHS, a beacon of free healthcare, is also a black hole of despair for employee happiness. It's like a candy store that only sells broccoli. Here's my question for you. Why do we romanticize the grind, especially when the grind is grinding us into dust? In some ways, I was really envious of all my friends who worked in London in the city. And even though they had probably quite poor work-life balances as I did, at least they were being financially rewarded for it. I remember there was times where I was being paid, especially my first year, less than a Domino's pizza delivery driver on the hour. This and the fact that I was really overworked, overstressed, emotionally drained, just meant that I was living a life that I really hated. And I just couldn't see myself doing it for the rest of my life. When I looked towards my senior colleagues, they didn't particularly live lives that I wanted to live. You're probably thinking, if I hated my job so much, why didn't I just quit? There's a couple of reasons. There's one, the sunk cost fallacy, where you feel you put so much time and energy into something that you need to continue it. Um, otherwise, that time just goes to waste. Secondly, People always would say that it gets better and better. Once you get to this certain level in your career, or once you make X amount of money, things will get better. Or maybe even once you retire, things will be better. So you work your, your whole life, and once you've retired, you can then be happy. So I started looking forward towards retirement, but it was so far away. It was 50 years away. And around this time, I came across a book by Tim Ferriss called The 4-Hour Workweek. Absolutely ridiculous title, no one can work for four hours a week. But there were some ideas in there that really kind of changed my perspective on things. And one concept he talks about is instead of saving it all for the end, taking mini retirements throughout your life instead. And when you think about it, there's no real reason you can't do this. Certainly it's not the thing that most people do and it's unusual, but the only difference is you're taking pockets of your money and you're spending them throughout your life rather than spending it all at the end. And not just your money, your time as well. Mini retirement, now we're talking. But here's my question, why don't more of us do this? Is it because we're too scared to break the mold, rock the boat, or is it because we're conditioned to believe 
that life has got to be a marathon, not a series of naturally occurring sprints. Those sprints might just save your sanity. And I guess along those same lines, the patients I met in hospital who worked their whole life and died shortly after they retired. It's not like that just happened once. I, I've met multiple patients in my life that that's happened to. So you could save it for later, but there may never be a later. So after I finished my couple years working in the NHS, I finished my foundation year. So if you're in the States, that's similar to your internship years. There's quite a natural career break. And I decided I wanted to take a mini retirement in that time. So I spent six months traveling Southeast Asia. And honestly, it was one of the happiest periods of my life ever. And I know it sounds super dramatic, but I remember thinking at that time, if I died, if I were to suddenly die, I would be able to die without any regrets. I felt like I had lived my life to the fullest and that I had gotten enough out of it. Looking back now, there's definitely a few more things that I need to do. There's definitely a few more things I would like to do before kicking the bucket, as, you, as they say. But at that time, I was genuinely happy with what I'd achieved. But of course, it had to come to an end. The money saved up for those couple of years of working. The money would run out at some point and I would have to go back to work and earn some more money. I'd have to come out of retirement. So I went back to the UK. I started earning again. I started working as a locum. For those of you who don't know what a locum is, a locum is kind of like a substitute teacher, but a substitute doctor where you're filling in roster gaps in hospitals where they're short staffed. It usually means you travel around a lot filling in these hospital gaps, but the hospital that I was working in in my foundation year, my final foundation year, was so short staffed all the time. They always had roster gaps, so I could always get work there. And I did certainly come back from my travels feeling refreshed and I was in a lot better place mentally. And I had a big realization at this time, which was the best doctors are the happy doctors. The doctors who are enjoying their job, who are enjoying their lives, are the ones that can really show up for their patients, who can have empathy, who can give the best treatment. I'm not saying that miserable or sad doctors can't be good doctors, they certainly can. And I've met many, but in general, the happiest doctors are the best doctors. When I was doing my locum work back in the UK, I was still very lost. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was a doctor, but I wasn't specializing in anything. So most people go into a training pathway after they've completed their foundation years, but there was nothing that was really calling to me. And the NHS was still a horrible place to work for, still super under-resourced, still felt super undervalued. But luckily at this time, I had a good friend, one of my best friends actually reached out to me, who was also a doctor and he had been working in Australia. He kept going on about how good it was, the weather, the money, the girls. Ah, Australia, I've been there. I spent years in Australia. It's a land of sun, surf, and apparently salvation. But let's unpack this. Is happiness really tied to a place? Or is it about the person you become when you let go of the baggage? Hmm. Food for thought, my friends. It was like something from an in-betweeners maybe. And I didn't really have anything else going on, so I made the jump. He got me a job in an emergency department, and I was still at this period of my life where I was unsure whether medicine or being a doctor was for me. After starting work in Australia, for some reason, something just shifted. and. For the first time, I started actually really enjoying my job. I wasn't crazy about it, but I could see myself doing it. I had come across this rule, which I call the 50% rule. I, don't, I have no idea where I got this from. I don't know if I made it up myself or if I got it from someone else. Probably just got it from someone else. But my rule was that as long as I was happy 50% of the time, that was enough. Completely impossible to be happy 100% of the time. It's definitely an attainable goal to be happy 50% of the time. Um, we still need to make room for all the other emotions in life, all the pain and the suffering. But I think 50% of the time is something good to aim for. And for the first time, I was happy more than 50% of the time. You know, that 50% rule might just be genius or madness. Either way, personally, I think it could be the sweet spot of sanity. Here's my challenge to you. Can you find that 50% in your own life? Or are you too busy chasing 100% perfection that doesn't exist? The perfect life is overrated. The balanced life could be where it's at. The only real test of intelligence is getting what you want out of life. I know so many smart people, especially going to medical school, especially some of my colleagues who are miserable, who are not getting what they want out of life. And it's not because they're not intelligent, they obviously are, but they're either very risk averse or, or just afraid, afraid to step outside the box and do something different because someone else might be judging them. They, are probably even just judging themselves. And before I go, I wanna tell you something. There's two types of prison in this world. There's a physical prison, and there's something much, much worse, which is a mental prison, which I was in for a long time. So many people are unknowingly shackled to a life they hate and are miserable because of this. But here's the good news. You have the key. All right, here's your take home wisdom. Write this down, folks. Life is not about reaching some mythical endpoint where everything's perfect. It's about finding joy in the messy, beautiful chaos of the journey. So if you're stuck in a rut, 
ask yourself this. What's one bold, crazy step that you can take right now to tip the scales toward happiness? Because trust me, the view is much better when you're not stuck in the grind.